Are you ready to hit the open road, head off-road, and maybe tow a decent load? Well, we've got three four-wheel drives here that are probably very high on your shopping list. The new generation Toyota Land Cruiser 300 Series in base model GX trim. We've also got the Land Rover Defender 110, which was recently launched, and we've got the D250, so a lower grade version of that four-wheel drive as well. And we've got the top spec Nissan Patrol TIL. It's a V8 petrol powered behemoth. So which is right for you? In this review, you're gonna find out. We've got time codes on your screen now, so you can jump ahead if there's something in particular that you're interested in. And there's also chapter markers down below if you are watching on YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, please, if you're there, make sure you hit like and subscribe and also hit that bell icon to keep up to date with everything we've got coming because there's plenty. And in this review, you're gonna see plenty of these three four wheel drives. Let's get to it. The pricing for these three SUVs is closer than you might think, and that comes down to the specification levels for each of these four-wheel drives that we've chosen to be represented here. While the Toyota Land Cruiser 300 Series GX mightn't be the one you really want, it was the closest to its rivals on the price front when it came to this review. And heck, with prices up so much, it might be the only one you can afford. All new 300 Series models are a lot more expensive than the old 200, and as such, the bare bones exterior treatment and hardly luxurious interior finishes mightn't be up your alley. But it still comes decently equipped with a 9 inch media screen, keyless entry and push button start, climate control aircon, fabric trim, vinyl flooring, a really nicely designed snorkel, LED headlights and 17 inch steel wheels with all terrain tyres. It's the only one of these SUVs that misses out on third row seats though. There's only room for five occupants and you only get a reversing camera. No parking sensors at all on this grade. The next most rugged looking of this trio is the Land Rover Defender 110, which we have here in a pretty basic D250 spec. You'll tell it apart by its 18 inch wheels on the outside, and it has LED lighting front and rear. Inside you get a 10 inch touchscreen, fabric seats, carpet flooring, and it has a 360 degree camera with parking sensors all around, while the Toyota just has a reversing camera and no sensors. This test car has a bunch of options too, like the black roof, middle front seat, making this a six seater. You can get the Defender with seven seats if you want to. And it has air suspension, some added off-road packs, heated front seats, a heated steering wheel, a heated windscreen, and even heated windscreen washers. Read the review for the full rundown. The Nissan Patrol TIL is the top spec version in its range, yet it hardly breaks the bank with its pricing just a few grand over the LC300 and less as tested than our Defender 110. Despite costing only a little more, it offers a whole lot more than its rivals when it comes to standard gear. Sure, you still get 18 inch wheels with all terrain tires and LED lighting, but the interior is sumptuously trimmed in leather and there are wood grain finishes here and there too. Plus in this grade, you get seven seats as standard, a 13 speaker Bose stereo, two eight inch rear entertainment screens, heated and cooled front seats, roof rails, a sunroof, a surround view camera, and front and rear parking sensors. It's hard not to see the Nissan Patrol TIL as the value for money pick of these three SUVs, but you've got to admire the fact that there are so many options available in the Defender 110 range. And also, if you spend a little bit more on your Land Cruiser 300, you're probably gonna get a much better SUV for your family. These SUVs cost plenty, but do you get the safety technology you'd expect when you're spending this much money? Well, let's take a closer look at what each of these big four-wheel drive wagons comes with. This screen is about to get filled up with information, but you need to know this. All of them have potentially life-saving auto emergency braking, a decent complement of airbag coverage, and lane-keeping technology. The Toyota is missing a few bits and pieces in this base model trim, though. Read my review for all the details. Each of these SUVs is similar but different when it comes to the levels of practicality on offer. The Toyota Land Cruiser 300 Series GX only comes as a five-seater and you can't get it as a seven-seater. You have to spend more if you want more seats. Whereas the Nissan Patrol TIL, which is the top spec, has seven seats while the base model has eight seats. And the Land Rover Defender 110, well, you can get it in five, six or seven-seater and our car has six. So if you're confused, read my full detailed review for a 
bit more information. And now we're gonna take a look at the practicality on offer inside each of these SUVs. Bags the middle seat. You don't get to say that in many SUVs these days, but this car, the Defender 110 D250 that we've got has the middle jump seat, which is a rare thing in most cars these days. And you can probably see why, because it doesn't necessarily feel like the safest spot to sit. Um, you are quite high, and uh, as you can see, fair bit of gap underneath here and I'd have to sort of either have my foot up here or over here with the passenger so it's an interesting thing not something that I would option and it is optional I'll jump into the driver's seat for this next bit so I can talk you through some of the other things in this Defender now you would think that something that is as rugged and as purposeful as this Defender 110 would feel low tech, but it doesn't because it's got some of the tech that you want and some of the more, I guess, manual controls that you would expect. So you've got your air conditioning controls, there's a bunch of buttons and knobs, which is really nice. Instead of having everything through a touchscreen like a lot of the other JLR products, there's tactile controls, which are really good when you're off-road, trust me. Plus, you've got this beautiful high definition screen, which has all the connectivity and stuff that you want, but also adds a level of technology that some of the other rivals in this test don't have. So for example, when we were towing, we set up the exact dimensions of the drawbar length and also the width of the caravan. So it had a towing mode that would adjust things based on that. It's really quite clever. And there's a lot of clever tech in this car, as well as the fact that this one has airbag suspension and multiple heights that you can choose a bunch of different drive modes and it's just a really clever way of laying all that information through the screen but also having manual controls down below and I love it. The other thing about this cabin is that it feels fun and that's going to mean a lot to you if you're the sort of person who is maybe adventure curious or you just want to show off to your friends because this is a really interesting cabin from the textures and the different furnishings inside this cabin. I love this weird, it's almost like a oh, wetsuit material across the top here. You've got hard wearing plastic. Um, I love the embossed Defender logo on the dashboard and you've got a part digital dash as well. The instrument cluster is part digital, so you've got digital speedo, but also some manual elements to it as well. Up here is one of the interesting points as well. Obviously, if you do have someone in the middle, you're gonna struggle to see through their head because there's a massive headrest here. And if you don't have that seat deployed, then you've got a spare tire in the way but there's an optional digital camera system so you can use the camera that's mounted on top and the aerial section and you do need as much help as you can get when it comes to seeing around this car because it doesn't have the best visibility from the driver's seat practicality otherwise is quite good let me just fold this back down so i can show you there are a pair of cup holders here that's a bit hard so you gotta watch your elbows on it and there's also a bunch of charge points here. You've got charge points down here. You've got another charge point here. You could basically charge anything that you want. Well, maybe not anything, but there's also a power point in the boot as well. Now, before we get to the boot, let's take a look in the second row. Backseat space in the Defender 110 is pretty damn roomy. I have to say this seat's set for me. 182 centimeters, six foot tall, heaps of knee room here, lots of foot room. And the seat comfort is really good too. It's a harder material. It's not necessarily gonna be soft on the backs of your legs, but uh, maybe don't wear your Speedos if you're sitting in the back. There are child seat anchor points in the back. You've got Isofix on the outboard seats and three top tethers as well. If you've got a child in a rear facing seat, then they might love the fact that there's a little window they can look out up in the roof line and it's not too bright that it'll wake them up on a road trip. I've got a six month old, so I get it. There are rear air vents back here as well. Obviously you've got access to those charge points which are on that middle front seat too. And all in all, it's a pretty nice place to be. But one other thing I'll call out is the materials back here are nice. Um, a little bit spartan in terms of storage options. There's no cup holders, there's no map pockets. You've got a pair of bottle holders down in the doors, but you also get a rear warning system. So if you start to open the door and there's something approaching from behind, then there's a little warning light there that'll tell you just hold on a sec. And I really like that, it's pretty clever. 
If you sat in the base model version of the 200 series Land Cruiser, you'd feel like you were sitting in a base model car. But in the 300 series Land Cruiser, things are considerably more contemporary and a lot more modern feeling and comfortable too. These seats are really good. Um, not so sold on this sort of mouse fur feeling suede-ish fabric. I don't love it and it's probably not going to be that comfortable if you are wearing short shorts. I don't wear short shorts but if you do then maybe let me know in the comments section below. Seats are comfortable though uh, and also the practicality in here is quite good. You've got a pair of cup holders or bottle holders here, a nice storage nook in front of the shifter and this clever lid which swings this way or this way. So that's pretty neat. So it means you have access to a deep storage section in there. You've got big bottle holders in the doors as well. No storage on top of the dash, no cup holders up near the vents, which might annoy you, but I think storage in here is pretty good. What I will say is though, GX model now comes with a black headliner. I don't love black headliners and I think it feels a bit dark in here. There's a lot of dark plastic and dark materials and it doesn't necessarily feel, well, very airy. Uh, that's weird because there's quite a lot of glass and you just have to f feel it and experience it to see what I'm talking about. Other things we can talk about. Okay, so you've got a 9-inch touchscreen media system, no sat-nav, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto on this base model GX. You've got dual zone climate control. I love these controls. These switches are lovely. I like the knurled feel mode selector down here as well. And I like the fact that this drive mode selector is quite prominent and easy to access, which just makes it a little bit easier to deal with when you are off-road or whatever you're doing. So up front, not too bad. Let's check out the second row. As I said before, the Land Cruiser 300 GX is a dedicated five-seater, and that means that you can't slide these seats forward or backwards. So this is the position you get, although you can recline the backrest. For me, it's pretty comfortable. I've got plenty of leg room in front of me. This seat's set for my driving position. I've got plenty of foot room as well, and headroom and shoulder room is pretty good too. You can fit three across in here pretty comfortably, a bit more comfortably than in the Defender, and there are rear seat air vents as well. No USB ports down here though, so charging for the youngsters, if you've got youngsters, might be a frustration point. You've got Isofix child seat anchor points on the outboard seats as well, plus three top tethers too and maybe if you are looking at a Land Cruiser 300 series, you might want to have a look at a GXL if you do want a few of those other creature comforts. There's no fold-down armrest with cup holders, no map pockets. I guess it's very similar to Defender in that regard. There's big bottle holders in the doors. But one interesting thing that I don't necessarily love, because I like LED lights, there's LED lights up the front, but halogens in here. So that's a little bit weird. Step back in time with me, people. It's a bit dated in here. The Nissan Patrol dates back to about 2010 and it's feeling it on the inside. The cabin is far from contemporary, I would say. It's very much aimed at an older demographic, I would say. And this uh, walnut look trim and the chrome, the lashings of chrome actually, and these sumptuous black leather seats definitely put this at a different target audience to the other two vehicles in this test. But the thing is that you're getting plenty inside this car in terms of equipment and, well, nice tech. So maybe not nice tech, you do get sat-nav with Suna maps as well. And it's a very old looking screen, uh, but you know, it's easy enough to work your way around. No CarPlay, no Android Auto. So if the latest in connectivity is what you're after, then you're not going to find it in here. But you do get dual zone climate control, you've got heated and cooled front seats, you've got a pair of USB ports, you've got a drive mode selector rotary dial down here, nice set of cup holders in here and a can holder as well, plus another cubby here, plus there's a fridge section in here in the TIL grade, which is nice. You get bottle holders in the doors. You've got this ruched leather on the door trims, which I actually quite like. Memory settings for the seats because they're electric as well. So 
you're not getting an up-to-date space, but you're getting a fairly well-equipped space. Also, it's the only one in this test with a sunroof. Just like the Defender, the Patrol in this grade has the camera that watches out the back as well instead of a rear view mirror because if you have all seven seats full, it's really hard to see past all those heads in the back. Now, speaking of the back, let's jump in the second row. Oh, hi. Um, just checking out the rear screens in this Nissan Patrol TIL. They're amazing, except they're not net connected. So I can't be watching myself or any of the other amazing Cars Guide presenters on our YouTube channel. So just make sure you go and subscribe because we'd love to have you as part of our team. Now, it does have screens in the headrests in the back of this Nissan Patrol. And that's cool, but yeah, you can connect to USB or a HDMI cable, or you can put a DVD in the front there and keep the kids entertained because, uh, you know, a road trip just isn't the same when you're not watching a screen, I hear. Now, the back seat here is quite good. There's plenty of space. This seat, again, set for me, 182 centimeters, six foot, heaps of knee room, more than the other two vehicles in this test. A little bit less tow room when it comes to the wiggle, but there's a nice flat floor. So three across will be pretty well done. Now, these seats don't slide. They do fold forward and tumble so you can access the third row. I'm not gonna show you the third row in this video. We've got other videos where you can see people clambering in and out of the back, and it's best left for smaller people or children. There's actually aircon controls down here as well and a couple of USB ports too. And unlike the others, there's a flip down armrest with cup holders and also map pockets on the seat backs and bottle holders in the doors. So back here, it's the most accommodating for occupants. There's also three top tether points and dual ISOFIX outboard seats too. If you've got young kids, it's feeling pretty family friendly in here. On your screen now, you'll see the stated boot capacity for each of these three SUVs. As you'd expect, it's a bit different between all three. And you'll also see what it looks like when we fit our Cars Guide luggage into the boot of each of these models. Plus, we're also going to show you what it looks like with three rows up in the Nissan Patrol. Some things to consider. The Defender is the only one with a side hinge tailgate, and it also has the spare on the back. The Land Cruiser GX has a tailgate now, and you can't get barn doors, which you used to get as standard. And the Nissan Patrol is the only one with an electric tailgate. So that might factor into your decision when you're choosing one of these three SUVs. Just notice how slow that is. Three very different takes on propulsion here. We've got a huge petrol V8 in the Nissan Patrol. We've got a twin turbo diesel V6 in the Toyota and an inline six cylinder twin turbo diesel with mild hybrid tech in the Land Rover Defender 110. So let's take a closer look at the details on each of these powertrains. Surely it can't be long for this world, the Nissan Patrol, with its 5.6 litre petrol V8 engine at odds with not only its diesel dominated segment, but also the automotive world at large. Speaking of large, the outputs are big from this unit, 298 kilowatts of power and 560 newton metres of torque. It has a seven speed automatic transmission and shift on the fly four wheel drive. Pipping the torque output of the Patrol is the Land Rover Defender. We've got it with the entry-level D250 powertrain with 183 kilowatts of power and 570 newton metres of torque from its three litre inline twin turbo diesel six cylinder. There is a more powerful D300 diesel if you want it and three different petrol engines, including a V8, but that one blows the price out by more than 130 grand. The D250, that we've got has an eight speed automatic and all wheel drive. The Land Cruiser has a slightly larger 3.3 litre twin turbo diesel V6 engine, and that's the only option across the model range. It produces a hefty 227 kilowatts and 700 newton meters, making it the torque king of these three SUVs. It has a 10 speed automatic transmission and permanent four wheel drive. Right, let's see how each of these SUVs drive, starting on the blacktop.
the Land Cruiser 300 series doesn't feel as big as it is in urban and highway driving, and it kind of shrinks around you. Part of that is to do with the steering, which is easy and predictable in urban settings and reassuring and confident, mostly, at highway pace. But the steer-by braking system for lane keeping can be a bit invasive. It offers a nice and comfortable ride over bumps and deals well with sharp edges too. Overall, it's very comfortable for urban driving and probably perfectly suited to family buyers because of that. The automatic transmission has plenty of gears at its disposal and it isn't afraid to shuffle through the cogs to ensure the best ratio for smooth and efficient progress. While I was fine with the transmission being a bit picky, some buyers might find it a bit annoying, especially if they're stepping into a 300 from a 200 series, which had a relaxed and composed powertrain. The main concern really is that it's noisy in the GX. The V6 diesel is not as quiet as the other two vehicles in this test in terms of cabin insulation, and our testers all thought the engine sounded pretty good, but it was more to do with the snorkel, which is just very noisy on intake. It feels so much bigger, that's the first thing you notice, but its steering is extremely light and actually kind of off-putting because of that. It can be really quick to turn at times, but then you still have to turn the wheel quite a lot. It's just not nearly as pinpoint accurate or enjoyable as either of the other two when it comes to steering. The suspension can be a little firm at times, but also wobbly when it comes to the body control, and the front suspension can shudder a little bit over sharp jolts. It's all a bit hodgepodge, and the sheer mass and size of the Nissan Patrol makes it a little unwieldy by comparison. What is enjoyable about this drive experience is the petrol V8 engine, which is very punchy and also sounds terrific. And if that's what you're into, you're going to love it. But you might find yourself taking gear shifting into your own hands as the transmission can be lazy in taking its time to downshift when you're climbing hills or coming to a halt. It's almost like stepping back in time a bit here. This is an old feeling drive experience and just isn't quite as polished or enjoyable as either of the other vehicles in this test. It's a convincing third place for the urban and highway driving experience. And the winner for this part of this comparison test is the Land Rover Defender 110D250. This engine is superb. It's a fantastically refined and beautiful revving engine. It's just a great inline six cylinder. One of the nicest engines on the market right now, I would say. And a lot of that is just, it feels more like a luxury SUV than the other two vehicles in this test. And obviously there is mild hybridness to it. You don't really notice it. So don't even buy into it, I would suggest. but. Also, the eight-speed automatic transmission, it's excellent. It just does a really good job of choosing the right gear that you need when you need it. But also, the engine and transmission will throttle blip when you're braking, you know, coming up to an intersection or something like that. And that just adds a little bit of extra confidence that it's, you know, offering a level of engagement that you don't get in the other engines of these two competitors. Now, that might sound like a pretty big compliment because, you know, we're talking about a 3.3 litre twin turbo V6 in the Toyota and a big old 5.6 litre petrol V8 in the Patrol. And both of those engines have their positive attributes. But I just think this engine is better than both of them anyway. Another thing all of our testers commented on in this test was that the steering of this Land Rover just feels really accurate. It's light, but still has a nice amount of weight to it. And it's also got less turns lock to lock. So there's less arm twirling when you're trying to park. Plus the air suspension does a really good job of ironing out the bumps in the road below you. Only when you hit a really sharp edge, say, if you're in town and you hit a sharp edged speed hump, that's when you notice the air suspension and the size of the wheels and the tires. But otherwise, it is so refined and such a likable drive experience. Really impressive.
all three of these four wheel drives are rated to the same level when it comes to braked towing capacity, a maximum of 3.5 tonnes, which is plenty. Now, we don't quite have that much weight here, but this Avita Topaz Caravan weighs 2750 kilos. So it's definitely enough to push these three and see how they cope on the big Aussie road trip, just in a much smaller scale. Thanks to Avita for lending us this van. Now, let's see how each of these three tow. To say we expected better of the LC300 would be apt when it came to towing. It wasn't nearly as composed or comfortable as its rivals for the driver or passengers during our towing test loop, and it felt considerably more busy and bumpy overall. There was lots of nose to tail bobbing, and you can really just feel that shorter wheelbase compared to its rivals. Just the ride comfort and compliance, not quite there. The LC300 steering was a highlight when towing with nice weighting and feel to the driver's hands. It still runs a hydraulic steering setup and the system does offer a level of engagement that's impressive, but that active lane keeping tech can correct the steering line by braking certain wheels. And there was one moment where the steer by braking system caught me unawares, which, you know, isn't ideal with three tons in tow. The engine is up to the task, but it can also sound a little raucous when you push it hard. And yes, on paper, the 3.3 litre V6 offers more grunt than the V8, and it also has more gears to play with for hilly roads or when accelerating from a standstill. 10 gears as opposed to 6 in the 200 series. And it can feel busy at times, as though it's doing more work than it ought to be doing when you're driving. That isn't to say it isn't settled at freeway pace. We sat at 110 k's an hour and the rev readout was just under 1500 RPM and it appeared to be in 10th gear too. Our hill climb section showed that it shuffled back to 5th gear to maintain 90 kilometers an hour. Pitching up in the patrol was difficult. The camera resolution is poor and the image quality is squint worthy. I relied on my colleagues the most with this vehicle when trying to line up the caravan. As for towing, the biggest issue I had with it was the steering response and accuracy, which simply doesn't offer a very true feel for the road. It's very hard to find a comfortable position for the steering on the straight ahead and maintaining a line requires a lot of constant adjustment but the Patrol felt more stable with a load in tow with its suspension ironing out bumps and lumps better than both of its rivals. While the nose to tail bobbing was bad in the Toyota and improved in the Defender, it was almost non-existent in the Patrol. The engine is a strong and revvy character with nice soundtrack to it and you'll hear plenty of it in traffic or when you're accelerating. The seven speed auto holds gears as long as it thinks it needs to and it doesn't muck around too much between ratios either. It's pretty quick to react to sudden throttle inputs as well, but when you're going slower, it can be a little eager to hang on to higher gears rather than downshift. Of note, the Patrol was revving a little higher at 110 k's an hour, 1800 RPM in seventh gear, but it's petrol powered and it has fewer ratios than its rivals. And on our hill climb, it dropped as low as third gear with some evident hustling between gears to hold 90 k's an hour. You bet it's me, here again in the Land Rover Defender 110 because it's the winner of the towing part of this test too. Uh, to say that we were surprised that this was the best tow vehicle of these three uh, would be an understatement. It is just so confident when it comes to towing a load and some of that comes down to the fact that it's got quite a lengthy wheelbase and also that air suspension does a really good job when you choose the tow mode it just sort of sets everything as it should be it's a really intelligent drive and I think that that's one of the things that all of us all the testers here thought was most impressive is that it just feels like it's designed to do whatever you ask it to do 2700 150 kilos behind and honestly at times you'd be surprised how little you feel it the engine offers enough grunt to get away sure it's not as I guess aggressively fast when you do have to plant your foot on the right pedal as the Toyota Toyota just has a torque advantage there's no doubt about that and obviously you're not getting that same sort of visceral experience of the V8 soundtrack in the patrol but 
what you are getting is a really pleasant and refined and comfortable drive experience while towing. And fatigue is not your friend when you've got something this big behind you. And let me tell you, I've done quite a few really long distance trips where you need a comfortable car to tow with. And comfortable, competent, and really well controlled is basically the three ways that I would describe the Land Rover Defender 110 D250 when it comes to towing. It's super impressive. One thing that we loved during our testing, all the testers, was that this car has a level of technology and a tech advancement that the other two just can't match. And things like the screen where you can touch and input your trailer dimensions, whether it's a caravan or a box trailer or a car trailer, and basically that will adjust everything to suit what you're towing. It's really, really clever. And for someone who isn't towing all the time, it might be perfect. But if you do tow a lot, you can save your caravan, whatever it may be, as a favorite on the screen and just hit the button and it'll remember what it needs to do next time. That sort of tech and that sort of thinking is what sets this car apart from the other two in this test. It's very smart and that will make it appeal for a certain buyer, but it might also make it unappealing for some more traditional buyers. We've come to a favorite off-road spot to see how these three four-wheel drives handle the rough stuff away from the highway. And in this spot, we have a mix of terrain, including some serious four-wheel drive low-range testing. So, does the Defender's air suspension give it a distinct advantage? And which of these three has the best showroom fit tyres? Well, let's find out, shall we? High hopes? You bet. The Land Cruiser name has quite a bit of heritage behind it, and our testing loop in the lower Blue Mountains, on a mostly sandy, dry surface that was at times pretty loose underfoot, well, the LC300, it was pretty good, even with road-going tyre pressures and the standard tyres, the Dunlop Grand Trek all-terrains, which are rather skinny in 245 by 75 17-inch size. And the GX, well, it proved adequate at maintaining traction and grip. And while it's the only model here with a snorkel air intake as standard, we didn't need that during our dry four-wheel drive test, but it's good to know you've got it. The double wishbone front suspension and four link rear suspension helped iron out big undulations with ease, with a soft spring rate making it feel settled, controlled and easy to manage over mixed terrain. It also has really good articulation with the front and rear axles managing to keep those tyres on the surface below. While we did engage low range four wheel drive, there's no limited slip differential and no locking differential to select in the GX. If we needed it, we could have been in trouble. And if you want diff locks, you need to add about $40,000 to the price tag of your Land Cruiser 300 series, or just get them on the aftermarket. What surprised us was that we noticed some underbody touchdown at certain points. The clearance just wasn't great, and that carbon fiber underbody protection system under the engine did earn its keep over some of the rocky crops that we drove over. As for the engine and transmission, there were no real issues in low speed crawling. There's not too much lag, and locked in low range, it just did its thing. The snorkel and fan noise were the only real issues in terms of the powertrain. The steering was fine and the turning circle okay. It took about 3.25 turns lock to lock on our test. We had expectations of the patrol touching down all through the descent of our off-road loop. With the worst approach angle and the sheer size of the thing, we expected the front and steps to kiss on some of the rocky, craggy sections, the washouts and rock ledges, but it exceeded expectations, though we did approach things just a touch more gingerly. It wasn't our intention to go out and damage a $100,000 four-wheel drive, and we weren't going to do that just for the fun of it. And you wouldn't do it if it was your own car, now would you? That said, we did end up with gouged sidesteps on both sides, and that actually drew our attention to the benefit of not having sidesteps like the other two vehicles in this test. The patrol's steering was a bit less annoying off-road than on, but its size and larger than the rest turning circle and slower steering, it's three and a half turns lock to lock, meant it felt really big on the tracks we were on. 
The Patrol has a sophisticated double wishbone suspension front and rear with what Nissan calls hydraulic body motion control with remote cross-flow reservoirs to better control weight transfer in bumpy terrain and while also aiming to level the car in cornering. It also comes standard with a rear limited slip differential and hill descent and hill hold control, so no wonder it felt pretty accomplished off-road in spite of its size. The petrol engine and 7-speed automatic transmission behaved themselves and the patrol was just a smidge more predictable off-idle as you might expect for a naturally aspirated engine. It makes perfect sense, non-turbo versus turbo is equal to linear versus lag. Yep, we're back in the Defender, and yes, it's won this part of the test as well. That's right, the Land Rover Defender 110 D250 is what we've picked as the pick of these three when it comes to off-road driving. And a lot of that comes down to the fact that it has air suspension. The suspension really does do a good job of isolating you from the surface below, but also keeping you in touch with it, which is kind of at odds with what you might think. So it isn't quite as pillowy soft as the Land Cruiser, for instance, but it does offer this real level of control over tougher obstacles and it's just so well sorted and also the fact that you can raise the vehicle up to suit the surface that you're driving over is just one of those great things about this suspension setup now on that suspension setup you might think that this air suspension will be super duper soft but in fact you actually sort of ride over the bumps and lumps where in the Land Cruiser it's sort of ducks into everything and it swallows the lumps and bumps a bit better so it's not perfect but it is very comfortable we did a five up test in this car and everybody on board said it felt the most comfortable and confident on our test track and that's saying something compared to the other two vehicles in this test and a real confidence inspiring addition to this vehicle is the off-road camera system. So it can monitor the road ahead of you or the track ahead of you in this instance and see through the bonnet essentially. There is a, a see-through bonnet function which is really quite neat. And it just means that you're not trying to judge things that you can't see, which is definitely the case in both the other four wheel drives here. When it comes to the steering, it's light and easy to maneuver, and the engine is very well sorted too. You can rely on engine braking in situations like this. There is hill descent control, of course, although we've just left the car in its auto off-road mode, and we haven't really had to touch it at all because it's so clever. Some things you might just want to consider at really low speeds when you're maneuvering and trying to avoid certain obstacles, sharp edges for example, or if you have a rocky cliff face that you're sort of trying to navigate through, you just have to be aware of the fact that the accelerator and brake pedal can be a bit touchy and at really, really low speeds, like when you're doing inch by inch movements, that can catch you out a little bit because you might find yourself jumping a little bit more than you might want to. So just be aware of that. So on our test loop, under our conditions, this is the best of these three. Not to say that the other two didn't impress us in plenty of ways, but the Defender 110, well, it was just the best today. On your screen now, you'll see the official combined cycle fuel consumption figure for each of these three four-wheel drives. And now you'll see the test figures that we saw across a mix of regular driving. And now you'll see what we saw when we did our towing test. And as you can see, all three were a bit over the claimed figure, but it's indicative of what you might see in your real world experience with these vehicles. Now when it comes to fuel tank capacity, the Defender has the smallest one, 89 litres. And the Land Cruiser has 110 litres, that's an 80 litre tank and a 30 litre sub. And the Thirsty Nissan has a 140 litre tank, but you'll need it to be that big because it goes through the drink pretty quick. 
Keen to figure out which of these three SUVs is the right fit for you as an owner? Well, you might be surprised how close they are when it comes to ownership. In fact, on paper, they match up pretty nicely. But the Land Rover, Toyota and Nissan all have a five year warranty plan. The Toyotas can be extended to seven years for the powertrain if it's logbook maintained. And just keep in mind that the Land Rover and Nissan both come with roadside assistance, but you have to pay extra for it if you buy the Toyota. The big issue for the Toyota is its service intervals, which are six monthly or every 10,000 kilometers. Considering it has to go in twice a year for servicing, it'll cost you 750 per annum to maintain. The Nissan also needs servicing every six months or 10,000. Capped price servicing is available, but the average cost over the first three years or 60,000 Ks is a massive $1,093. The Land Rover? It'll tell you when it needs servicing and it has a service pack available for this powertrain that covers five years or 130,000 kilometers of travel and it costs just $2,650, which sounds like a lot, but over the average, it works out as less than the others. In fact, it should cost half as much to maintain as the Nissan. So there you have it, three very different answers to the same question. But which is the pick of these three four-wheel drives? Well, across our exhaustive testing, on-road, off-road, towing, inside, outside, fuel use, everything that you could think of, we had some interesting findings with these three vehicles. First off, the Nissan Patrol TIL. Sure, it is value packed for what you're paying, you do get a lot of equipment, but it is let down by its very thirsty 5.6 litre petrol V8 engine. And in this top spec, the approach angle isn't quite as good as you might want it to be if you're in the outdoors like we are. When it comes to the Toyota Land Cruiser 300 Series GX, it's not very base model feeling, thankfully, but if you are after a Land Cruiser 300 Series, I reckon you should spend a little bit more and at least go for the GXL, which will be a more comfortable and a seven-seater version of that vehicle. Otherwise, pretty impressive in a lot of ways, but let down a bit by its towing performance, if we're honest. And when it comes to the Land Rover Defender 110D250, it was a bit of a surprise packet. It towed really confidently. And when it came to on-road driving, it was the most refined and comfortable in our testing. Off-road, well, it's built for it. And that airbag suspension with adjustable height really does come into its own when you're in the rough stuff like we are. But tell us which one of these three you would choose in the comments section below. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit like and subscribe, hit that bell icon so you can keep up to date with all of our videos because we've got plenty more great content coming from Cars Guide. Thanks for watching.